My name is Grace Lee, CEO and the President of Taiwan Ratings Corporation, and I will be your moderator today. Now, let me briefly introduce you the two speakers today, and you can find their detailed biography in their presentation deck. The first one is Mr. Asushi Mazda, Counselor for International Affairs and the Chief Sustainable Finance Analyst at the Japan Credit Rating Agency, i.e. JCR. He is concurrently the Aqua Chairman. And the second one is Ms. Lina Wang, Senior Analyst of Sovereign Ratings, China Chenxin International Credit Rating Corporation, i.e. CCXI. Her colleague, Lin Chen, Assistant Director of Research Institute, will join the Q&A session. I believe we all agree that economies are clearly slowing, but are we going into a recession? The speakers will share their insights and will discuss the recent developments in the global economy with the focus on Asia and China. Now, I should now hand it over to Mr. Asushi Mazda to kick off today's webinar. Thank you very much for introductions. My name is Atsushi Masuda. Uh, I'm uh, talking about us uh, today um, about the global economy and the Asian economy. And then right now, if you are talking about the Asian economy, I think that there is no fundamental problem. But uh, this recession issue should be context contextualized in the global uh, economies and the developments. So from this angle, I will talk first in uh, uh, global economy sense. Then at the, uh, 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 I will come down to the Asian economic situations. So basic question is, uh, uh, will recession come? For example, United States uh, already recorded two consecutive uh, negative growth of first quarter, second quarter of the, uh, this year. So in that sense, U.S. is already entered into the recession. Uh, in that sense, and the, to what extent and the U.S. recession has been spread into the all over the world, that is a question. And the, uh, this recession is uh, severe enough, uh, tough enough, in comparison to the great financial crisis, uh, which was recorded in 2008, uh, this is the core. And also that under this time, inflation seems to be reviving. So to what extent inflation is uh, dominating the world? And those are central questions uh, I'm going to address. Now, first, I'd like to talk about uh, great moderations. Uh, great moderation means uh, macroeconomic stability period, uh, which was recorded. Um, I think there are two great moderation. One is great moderation. One is, is starting from 82 to 2007. And those uh, almost an, um, um, 20 plus years is a, we observe a very stable macro environment. And then, then great financial shock, Lehman shock is appeared. After that, and then we suppose we thought that the great moderation was over, but next 10 years after great financial crisis, um, still uh, this more relative, uh, moderate period continued. So I call it great moderation too. But uh, uh, question right now is, uh, is this this time, is it really uh, finish a great moderation or not? Um, so this one is a great moderation one. As you see that under these inflation rates and the growth uh, rates, volatility, uh, annual uh, uh, perturbations, fluctuation is very re re relatively limited. Uh, this is called uh, great moderations. I call it great moderation one. Uh, it's not uh, just a uh, US economy, it's applied to the Japan as well. As you see that the uh, business cycle period is a uh, longer, getting longer and longer. First 50s and to 70s, 48 months is a, a, a average period of a business cycle. Then 70s, 52, 
the 90s and the 2023. So uh, not just only st more stable, those uh, business cycle is prolonged. Those are kind of a tendency of a recent macroeconomic business school. Um, this is from uh, FRB's and the website, uh, FRB history and the great moderation 82 to 2007. They explain <coughs> three factors in, important. First one is the structural change of economy. Maybe manufacture to the service sector or maybe just in time inventory or information technology. Those are kind of a structure change which goes to the uh, more stable or macroeconomic situations. And the second factor uh, which brought to the uh, great moderation is good track. Simply the number of shock, macroeconomic shock is very limited. And the third factor is good policy. Macro uh, policy uh, is improved. Uh, for example, uh, monetary policy is improved. And the, this week, uh, uh, ex chairman Bernanke got a Nobel Prize uh, during his uh, time. He explained uh, this good policy, policy improvement is contributed to the more stable factors. Um, first, and it was uh, considered uh, great moderation ended in 2008 when uh, Lehman shock occurred. But uh, as a hindsight, uh, from a viewpoint of standing from uh, 2020, that another uh, great moderation too continue even after a uh, uh, great financial shock until COVID shock hit to the, the 2019. Um, this one is the first element, good luck. That means a number of the shock, of which is uh, assaulted to the great uh, world economy is limited. But as a matter of fact, if you see uh, during those great moderation one period, Asian crisis and the LTCM crisis, this one is Russian, uh, the dot-com shock. Those shock is already appeared. So despite of those shocks and those smaller crises, great moderation occur, macroeconomic stability occur. That's um, another good track, commodity price volatility. Uh, this one is a commodity price and a weekly percentage change. As you see, uh, maybe there are volatility clustering uh, before uh, 82 and also before and after uh, great financial crisis of 2008, and there are uh, uh, commodity price volatilities uh, slightly uh, increase, but not great change is observed here. So in that sense, core factor of the commodity price volatility appears to be, remain the same. Um, policy factors, uh, this is very important. And the, uh, when uh, I studied economics, uh, or if you study economics before 90s, maybe business cycle uh, is a very important terminology. Uh, the how to decompose these trends and the cycle. Uh, this is a, a kind, kind of term. And Barnes Mitchell, uh 1946 this paper is uh, defined to the business cycle as a recurrent departure from a uh, uh, return downward normal state and the uh, economic methodology to decomposing uh, gdp into the trend and the cycle this is a way of thinking and the business cycle but recently uh, this sort of dichotomy is the departure and the recent business cycle model, or maybe a DSGE, if you study economic cluster 2000, uh, 2000, year 2000, maybe uh, you are familiar with those terms. But uh, this real business cycle theory consider uh, exogenous technological shock is accumulated and formulated to the trend and also uh, fluctuations. So uh, in that sense, uh, the uh, GDP pass is depend on the history. And so it's very important to what extent and you experience downtown or not. So it's very important to avoid those scar of downtown. 
uh, in order to uh, maintain kind of a good economic policy record. So where I was thinking of economic, macroeconomic policy has been changed in the recent 20 years. I recommend this uh, papers. I'm working with paper, a good, very good summary of the changing of macroeconomics and the way of thinking change. But uh, policy implication is in order to avoid of those scars, very active policy intervention is recommended. This is a change occurred. And uh, after particular for great financial shock uh, crisis of 2008, very active monetary policy, active fiscal policy is very important, recommended. So this is a kind of structure change. So uh, this Amundi uh, world, uh, maybe largest in the European asset management company is uh, uh, concluded great moderation is this time really end because good policy and good track may disappear at the same time. This is a reason. And also that and the rolling average of volatility indicating maybe this time um, already a stable period is already ended. Um, this one is market implied volatility. It's uh, derivative price by using a black shows formula uh, can be uh, calculated to the market expectation factors. Uh, so this is the so-called implied volatility factor from uh, oil price. As you see, a market expectation about the volatility is market, uh, markedly increased recent. So market participant consider uh, those uh, uh, less volatility period has been already over. Uh, this is a kind of a implication from a market calculations. So in that sense, uh, maybe uh, many people is a feeling that they even uh, those uh, great moderation survived in the after great financial crisis. But this time uh, the uh, great moderation may uh, finish. And this is a kind of a, a people's uh, general sentiment. And next issue is a recession come. Uh, this is a next agenda. Um, this end is a, a GDP growth of this year expectation uh, by uh, participant of the, uh, the monetary policy board of the United States. <clears throat> um, June projections, June period, they consider U.S. and the economy is growing to the one and a half to the two percent, but this time. September projections, they already uh, uh, downward adjusted to their projections of those and the monetary policy board members is consider zero to the uh, zero point five percent and these uh, this year's projections. Um, as I noted at the beginning. First and the second quarter already recorded to the negative growth of the United States economy. So in that sense, technically speaking, the U.S. is already entered into the recession. Um, one important thing is that you have to uh, <coughs> aware that the business cycle and the credit cycle. Credit cycle is the financial market conditions and the uh, cyclicality. And um, maybe this one is a, a precedent, precise uh, before to the business cycle. As you see, this was broke, uh, black line is a short term interest rates and the blue dotted was the recession period of the United States economy. And uh, this 1990, this uh, the recession is a Gulf War and um, 2000. And the immediately after dot, dot com bubble burst and the recession followed. Um, Lehman shock, great financial crisis is occurred 2008. Uh, the before, the prior to the, those uh, three recessions, marked increase of financial volatility or uh, short-term interest rates is occurred. Um, COVID, the March 2020, there are small, uh, Recession is observed 
Normally, recessionary is declared uh, for by a uh, two consecutive quarterly uh, minus and growth of GDP. But March uh, 20, uh, NBR, uh, the Research Institute of the United States, declared uh, it's a uh, recession, even if it's uh, just one month. But this time, there are small uh, volatilities occur before this and the recession is occurred. So in that sense, and the credit cycle indicated this one, but the, this uh, recession was suppressed by very strong uh, uh, policy actions. Monetary policy is uh, making a, a unprecedented and the liquidity injections and the fiscal moment, uh, movements is uh, depress and those and the recession of the 2020 March. Uh, in that sense, uh, those uh, COVID shock uh, didn't cause of uh, those uh, this sort of uh, the recessions. But now, another sign of those credit cycle is that uh, uh, leading to the uh, recessions. This one is a very good and a summary of uh, asset management company Fontbell is a describe uh, credit cycle. And the credit cycle is apparently cycle of credit, and the growth is maybe strong, accelerating, and the peak out and the slowing down. But this sort of credit cycle is accompanied with a change of yield curve. Yield curve steep, flattening, flattening, importing, and steeping. Because and there was a price movement is accompanied with those credit cycle. Uh, if uh, the credit cycle will accelerate, uh, there may be uh, inflation pressure mounting. So this is the reason why uh, yield curve is uh, steeping. So maybe uh, the yield curve is uh, changing ahead of the business cycle. This is a real figure. Uh, the, uh, this one is a government yield of uh, black ones 10 year, uh, brown ones five year, uh, two years. So in this sense, if this and uh, the uh, band is w w w wide, become a wide. Uh, that means uh, the yield curve is steeping. And if those three lines is compressed, yield curve is uh, flattening. So in that sense, there is a some cycle of the uh, yield curve steep and flattening and become a steep, steep then flattening. This one is uh, close to linked with the business cycle. So uh, there is a one method that, that by using yield curves shape to product of the uh, business cycle. This is a method. But one country which you cannot apply to the, this method to, in order to predict of the business cycle, uh, because if government try to control yield curve and the, those yield curve shape uh, is not a predictor of the business cycle. Uh, I, I think and the, this methodology, uh, the projection of the recession from a uh, uh, yield curve cannot be applied to the Japan because uh, the monetary authority is engaging over those uh, the uh, credit cycle yield curve control. Um, this one is the situation of the credit cycle. Uh, the, and this one is a uh, macroeconomic report of the KKR, uh, private equities. They have a very good and, uh, macroeconomic units, even though it's a small, uh, because their investment uh, the policy is quite linked with the business cycle and the credit cycle. Um, this is showing to the uh, higher yield ones, price is uh, already going down at 14% uh, from uh, uh, this January to the, this and the July. Um, it's already down 15%. Uh, so we are uh, feeling in the mood of the recessions. But one thing, and for example, oh, great financial crisis of 2008, average decline is 35%, but the triple C range, 50% decline of the bond prices occurred. Compared to that, currently that the average is 14 and the triple C is 18. So in that sense, steepening is not enough. So in that sense, it's a, a kind of a middle of the falling of credit cycle, it's a situation. And this one is a revision of the IMF's and the uh, uh, economic projections. World economic outlook is official uh, worldwide. 
and almost 120, 180 uh, member country of IMF. And the IMF has uh, maybe 120 country team. Individual team is uh, making a projection of the individual country and accumulated global uh, projections. And by doing that, maybe they devise maybe three times a year of uh, worldwide economic projections. But this one is notable projections that change from uh, this year's April to the July. And the U US is uh, this year's projection is dropped by one and 1.4 percent drop compared to that emerging Asia is 0.8. But the next year US projection is also dropped downwards 1.3 percent. But Asia is a 0.6 percent now 0.5 percent. So in that sense, maybe US and also Germany. France, those uh, kind of uh, area which is originated to the fear of uh, recessions. And so uh, the IMF is projected uh, making a revision of the economic projection of uh, those countries. And this one is the recession probability calculations. This one is another uh, method, uh, not uh, using to the uh, yield curve type. Uh, it's a regime switch, so-called, and the economic methods and making projections. This one is very good uh, pro pro predictors. Uh, uh, this one is a Gulf War. This one is a dot-com bubble. Uh, this one is a Lehman shock, great financial crisis. And this one is COVID. So far, model didn't pick up of any uh, the major increase of a probability. Uh, this is a, a proje projections. Um, downside scenario compared to the baseline, and uh, what is a uh, downside factors? And uh, this is uh, coming from IMF projections view or uh, exercise. But for this year, major downside elements is a uh, additional sanction to the Russia and uh, this blue one, and also uh, possible shutdown to the gas to the Europe. Uh, this one is a red one. And the next year's major factor is uh, this additional or shutdown of the gas export from Russia to uh, Europe, and also possible inflation expectation deteriorations. If expectations uh, of inflation is uh, mounting, and the uh, people consider more uh, downside uh, the uh, GDP because the people save the money. And they don't expend, uh, uh, spend the money. So uh, that's a downside uh, factors. So in that sense, uh, this year GDP is downward and 0.7% and the next year almost under 1% downside possibility. And the major driving factor is one is maybe Russia-Ukraine related sanctions and the stop gas. That means maybe Europe is a very important source of the uh, further recessions. And the next year, further uh, deterioration of the inflation expectation may cause it to the recession. This is a factor. Left hand side figure is gas export to the Europe by sources. So this green one is Russian gas to the uh, Europe. And uh, it's already uh, almost an, uh, one third compared to peak. And the uh, gas export to the Europe is a drop by 20% of this year. And um, this is a, a major source of the uh, electricity supply. So German, uh, the Minister of the Economy is consider if further gas cut is occurred, that will a uh, very bad impact for production to continuations. So uh, there is a major downside factor for further cut down. And this one is a, a gas pipeline exports to the Europe. And the peak time is maybe 450 uh, million uh, cubic meters. But right now, 150. In that sense, compared to the peak, gas supply from Russia to the Europe is uh, downward by one third, cut by one, two thirds. But still, one third is the remain. And this week, uh, the IMF uh, World Bank general meeting is occurred in the Washington. Uh, maybe policymakers consider further st uh, strengthening of the economic sanction uh, sanction to the Russia. So this factor 
is a, a, a maybe a most single most important downward factors for recessions. And the second factor is a monetary tightening. This uh, this time is a maybe a fastest in the last 35 years. This black one is a, a current pace of the interest rate hike. Uh, this one is the fastest in the interest hike. This yellow one is a 98, which means Black Monday. Uh, in order to respond to the Black Monday, that and they require very rapid response. But this time, again, that kind of a uh, very rapid response of the uh, US. So this uh, very rapid response of the US rate hike may cause a disparity among the monetary policy among the various countries. So this one is also a factor which goes to the um, yen, uh, no, no, uh, data appreciations. Then uh, the, that goes to the same recession factors uh, to the other uh, trading partners. And uh, this disparity of the monetary policy, why don't the disparity cause to the uh, financial flows to the emerging market? This blue one is a, a bond flow, and this same blue is equity flows. As you see from uh, this year, beginning of this year, emerging market uh, the uh, fund flow is already limited and constrained. Then at the inflation stay, uh, this is the next question. Um, when this inflation start issue or started, as you see, before 2021 October, inflation projection is a, uh, slightly pick up, but the, uh, not more than four percent global inflation headline CPI. But after the, this year, uh, for green one is a January 2002. Uh, starting from uh, the, this January, that the inflation projection is upward revised. And um, this July projection is predicted 9% as a peak time of a third quarter of 22. As you see, uh, since about beginning of this year, that everybody concerned about the inflations. Um, this one is a, a monetary policy board members, uh, the projection of the inflations. So this one is a Japan. Japan, um, 2020, this year, that an inflation may pick up slightly above 2%. And the Kuroda-san, uh, the uh, governor of the Central Bank of Japan, uh, is a desire to uh, push up inflation rate above the 2% and his uh, the, uh, dream come true after 10 years of his time. But uh, uh, everybody consider it's falling back again to the 1% after the 2023. This one is the United States. And this United States policy world core inflations is a PCE, consumer inflation is a peak, peak out this year uh, at the level of the 6%. This is a, a policy board projections. And the magnitude of the crude oil price hike, uh, this blue one is a, a first oil shock which occurred to the uh, 73. Oil price is almost under four times compared to the beginning. Uh, compared to this one, uh, the, this year's oil price increase is a very rapid and uh, big. Uh, from 80 to the 120 is a peak. But then uh, now going back to the 80 and the OPEC oil producing con uh, country is now discussing the introduction or they already decided to in de introduce of the uh, production control uh, by 2% uh, maybe last week. So this green one is uh, this time. Um, uh, crude oil price is not too uh, big increase, almost under, uh, one and a half times compared to the uh, first, second oil shock. 
but uh, commodity price increase is very large. Cereal, wheat, where that Ukraine is a main production sites, and the commodity price is almost two times, two and five times, uh, two and a half times the uh, bigger. And also natural gas coal is also recorded very large increase. Um, Apparently, that the uh, Russian sanction is uh, affecting to this uh, the natural gas price. Um, uh, coal is uh, now revived uh, because uh, the, everybody considered to the uh, coal should be replaced uh, with the natural gas as a source of the electricity generations. But uh, they stop uh, stopping to the uh, coal uh, fired uh, electricity. So, in that sense, coal prices are, uh, that are picking up because uh, it can be used uh, for immediate needs of the electricity supply. And this one is a, a provocation uh, system uh, processes difference. ECB at the European Central Bank is considered. When oil price and increase to what extent uh, that can be uh, uh, propagated to the wage, uh, there is a fundamental difference between uh, the uh, Europe and the US economy. Because uh, two factors is important. One factor is maybe strength of the labor union of uh, uh, US and the, uh, uh, Europe is different. And the second one is maybe unemployment situation is a, a second determinant of the, those provocation mechanism. This one is a, a fast oil shocks and the response to the uh, uh, European economy. And the uh, European case, the labor union is very strong. And the, when oil shocks occurred, uh, the labor union demanded to the wage hike immediately in order to protect of the those and the uh, wage. So as a result, real consumer wages increase and the labor share in the GDP is increased by four percent points. As a result, and the GDP pass-through of the uh, oil price increases is very high. In the end, and by uh, to the end of the 1975, uh, twenty-five percent increase is observed for GDP deflators. And contrary to the uh, Europe, this is the U.S. and the response. U.S. cases, those wage increases is very limited, uh, negative wage increase, and also that the productivity increase is very big. Um, company would like to make an effort in order to increase uh, the productivity. Uh, so in that sense, they absorb this shock. So in that sense, uh, GDP deflator pass-through is very limited. Uh, the accumulated increase of the uh, inflation is 20%, 5% point lower compared to the Europea. So in that sense, uh, the response to the single shock may differ, uh, depends on the, those labor union situations and unemployment situations, maybe uh, the industrial compositions. This is a, a analysis uh, conducted by the ECB. Second factor, which is the determinant of the inflation is maybe apparently an un unemployment rate. But uh, this one is the U.S. economy's COVID shock, and surprisingly, that the COVID shock is short-lived. Um, current unemployment situation is uh, already regained pre-COVID re level. So, in that sense, and the uh, labor situation is very tight. So, United States, the inflation can be raised. Second factor, that, that uh, sensitivity to the general inflation to the price shock is quite high because the labor condition is already tight. Um, then default rates will increase. Where do we stand? Uh, this one is the uh, next factors. This one is the uh, uh, Alliance Bernstein's reports. Um, apparently, rating agency accumulated a lot of scores, but the, uh, we have a kind of property, uh, property rights uh, to the uh, product of other com companies uh, we cannot use. So I quote uh, this 
uh, asset management companies' reports. Um, right now, uh, default rate is quite low compared to the historical average, and we are uh, living observing quite low default rates, uh, partly because um, monetary policy uh, the measures is in order to avoid all those and the COVID shock. Um, ample uh, injection of the liquidity is already conducted. That suppressed default rates in, in a quite low rate. So in that sense, if recession occurred, apparently default rate will increase. And this one is for sure because right now it's a lowest level of the default rate. So for, for sure, that is ahead of the uh, uh, direction of the increase. But to what extent, that is a, a question. Um, this one is a, a emerging market situations. And the emerging market issues, market issuance is a decre declining. Like right in uh, 2020, 250, uh, 225 uh, issues uh, observed for 20 months uh, level. But uh, right now, this one is declining to the 125 almost half uh, level of the uh, number of the uh, emerging market issues. And also this one is uh, MBs, uh, more than 1,000 basis points. Right now, 20% of the emerging market economy is uh, uh, experiencing uh, uh, sp MB spreads more than 100 basis points, uh, 1,000 basis points, that means Already uh, from uh, 2020, emerging market is entering into the kind of elevated risk uh, uh, situations. And this one is a, a Japanese default rate, number of bank bankruptcy. Uh, partly because uh, the recovery is uh, taking place and also for uh, um, COVID shock period. Uh, injection of the liquidity and also fiscal measure replaced increase of the bankruptcy numbers and the default rate as well. Maybe restaurant, hotel experience some rise of the default rates. But in general speaking, default rates is suppressed thanks to the, those monetary policy injections, money, money injection, liquidity injections, and also fiscal measures. Um, sector trends, this one require a lot of uh, information and the uh, sector may be different. For insurance, I pick up several typical cases, insurance, home center, construction material, um, the medical supplies and the steep reductions. And the, uh, for individual or industry is a, a very different situations. Pre pandemic level is already regained or not. And the rating focus is maybe a regional performance is very focused and the stable outlook. So this sort of situation by industry by industry, we are thinking pre COVID level is already regained. And to what extent and the, uh, this further shock can be uh, absorbed. This sort of situation is now uh, we are assessing. So up to now that uh, I'm talking about uh, some general situation of the global economy, and uh, uh, maybe uh, last three minutes, <laughs> and I'm talking about the uh, Asian economy. M maybe I request five minutes extensions. <laughs> and, uh, this one is an uh, experience of the Asian crisis. As you see, for Indonesia, experience of a seven notch down from October uh, 97 to the March uh, 28. And the Korea experienced 10 notch down from uh, uh, October 97 to the December 97. So just only two months. And the uh, rating agency uh, downgraded 10 notches. So in that sense, and the recent and the, um, sovereign economy is very difficult to predict because um, 
traditionally, we are watching about the fiscal and the balance of payment and the foreign reserve situation only. But recent contagion issue, capital market crisis is what's very difficult to uh, predict. So in that sense, after Asian crisis, we overcome those shortfall of the system and the shortfall of the projections. One is maybe systemic risk assessment is very important. And another one is contagion preventions. Contagion risk should be evaluated. Like a balance payment, a balance sheet and analysis is very important. And the third factor is macro prudential regulations. And the, uh, those not just only uh, regular uh, policy and uh, the uh, of monetary policy and the fiscal policy. Recently, macro prudential regulation is uh, very important. And the two photo extent and the macro prudential regulation is addressing to the current situation. That's easy. maybe post Asian crisis period and uh, financial risk. Um, that uh, fortunately, the COVID risk is very short arrived. And as you see, uh, there may be 2020, uh, June, and the third quarter is uh, this one is a uh, Omicron risk. Um, uh, that's observed. But uh, basically, after the third quarter of 21, the, uh, the Asian economy is already recovered. But well, there is uh, some regional uh, discrepancy. Uh, Asian crisis developing uh, the developing Asian uh, regions and the uh, 2021 recorded 7% of economic growth, but South Asia is already recorded to uh, minus 8%. Southeast Asia uh, for 2021 minus 10%. So in that sense, compared to the East Asia, those South Asia and the South East Asia and the Pacific Islands, those are remained a little bit behind. Um, spread and the capital outflow. And this one is increase of the uh, MB, uh, country risk spreads. Pakistan, Sri Lanka, uh, as you may be aware, and then also Tajikistan. Those are just an increase from January 22 to, to July 22. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka is a increase, uh, spread is a 42%. So in that sense, and the sum of the weak can, uh, country is experience of a uh, rapid deteriorations, that is a, which is occurring. And also uh, this one is a foreign uh, capital flow. First half of this year, that the outflow is already uh, observed. And headline inflations, the country surrounding Russia is already experienced and the uh, inflation more than 10 percent. East Asia still remain good. Sri Lanka is now a little bit crisis because exchange rate is uh, collapsed and the uh, May inflation factor is 45%. So in that sense, country-wise disparity is now widening. Weak country is now deteriorating. And this one is a recession probability. It's a just a, a survey data. Well, Sri Lanka recession probability is 85. And the Japan, South Korea, China, 20, 25. And those and the Taiwan, Pakistan, Malaysia, 20 range. Uh, Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia is less than 10%. Uh, so this is a, a survey data. Uh, now that uh, the summary, the, I think uh, the uh, inflation pressure is now uh, mounting apparently. That uh, the, if uh, the inflation is mounting everything and the uh, compressed volatility period, may have ended and that is maybe for sure and the risk factor number one is as you see uh, this and the uh, russian conflicts and the second one is maybe an unprecedented uh, interest rate hike this space may amplify the financial sector volatility and um, i think it may be think uh, safe to think that the great moderation is already over and the fear of recession is already indicated uh, by watching to the changing the credit cycle. 
um, maybe sector damaged by the COVID shock may affect it too, uh, very much. Uh, so this is a, a short summary of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masuda. And my speech will focus on the recovery of China's economy amid multiple challenges. And looking ahead, China's economy will rebound in the second half of the year, but downside risks still persist. My speech can be basically divided into two parts. Uh, it will go through the fundamentals and outlook of China's macroeconomy, and then will focus on the external and internal risks and challenges that the Chinese economy is currently facing. So first, let's look at some numbers to get some basic idea of how this economy is operating right now. And uh, we can see from the chart here, some good indicators are infrastructure investment, and also uh, we can see retail sales. There is an increase in retail sales, but to leave a question mark here, and some weak, some indicators of weak performance, we can see the service industry and also the real estate sector is keep running lower and since uh, April. It's been active for a long time. Uh, we know export is pretty strong last year and is a highlight of the Chinese economy like since the COVID-19. Uh, but right now it has sign of slow down significantly. And as for macro financing, we can see the social financing is still running a little bit weak. Is supported mostly by the improvement of the government factors. And as for like the loans to residents, it's not very strong. Seeing the weak GDP growth in the second quarter, and is recorded a weak growth of 0.4% with the recurrence of the pandemic and prolonged lockdowns in parts of China. We can see the contribution of service industry and consumption to GDP had hit the lowest level since we have statistics. By the end of last year, the authorities put forward the idea that China is facing the threefold pressure. The threefold pressure include contraction in demand, like supply shocks, and also weak expectations. And now I would say the threefold pressure has been even higher this year. And in this case, a growth rate above five is hard to achieve. So we expect the girls to moderate to 4% in this year. And if we take a look at the three major industries, we can see the industrial sector is more resilient. Well, the, re the rebound of industrial added value is pretty strong, but it's not the same case for the service industry. Production index is keep a low performance. It remained at a low level of 1.8% in August. As I mentioned, the contribution of service industry to GDP has declined sharply. We can see from the diagram here, the gray line represents service industry. Now the contribution of service industry is even below that of the first and second industry, which is very on euro. And now we move to the three major driving forces of economic growth. As for investment, we can see the repair is mainly driven by infrastructure investment. And we could see the pattern of strong infrastructure and weak real estate may continue. And the growth rate of manufacturing uh, re remained as stable at 10%. Well, it may be disturbed by the slowdown of export. When it comes to the real estate sector, we can see the performance is really weak. The growth rate of the investment in August was minus 7.4%. And the weak financing and sales coupled with the crisis of loan suspension in some cities are adding to the pressure of the real estate sector. And we will go to the uh, real estate problem later in the second part, as is a very crucial issue for China right now. And next is about consumption. We can see the retail sales of customer goods went up, but uh, this trend is very, not very solid. As we know, consumption reflects the long-term income expectations. And currently, the slowing household income, higher unemployment rate among the young people, and risk of shrinking property values all points to a lower expectation. So all this together may restrict the recovery of consumption. 
And in August, the real sell, uh, retail sales rebounded, but it is mostly due to the base effect. So market confidence needs to be rebuilt in order to enhance consumption. And as for import and export, uh, we could see export is a major driving force of economic growth in last year. Currently, export has played a major role in supporting industrial production and investment. But now the foreign trade is under pressure due to the weakening of price factors and slowdown of the world's economies. And also the pandemic prevention and uh, control policies. So the strong momentum is not likely to continue. And we can see here from the export sector is closely linked with the manufacturing sector. So the slowdown in export may lead to a slowdown in manufacturing sector as well. Let's talk about price. It's very hot topic right now as most economies are facing severe inflation. China and Japan are two exceptions, I would say. China's PPI continues to decline with falling commodity prices. And we've seen a trend of uh, CPI and PPI to converge. So the inflation pressure in China has eased with declining PPI. I think this decline may open up the space for, for the possible rate cut in China. Currently, the market demand is weak and the core CPI is projected to stay subdued. Let's talk about the foreign exchange rate. Uh, in response to the severe inflation, we have seen the Fed and the European Central Bank have accelerated the pace of interest rate hikes. But, and due to the rise of US dollar index, the world currencies are experiencing high depreciation pressure. And for this year, we've seen the depreciation pressure for RMB is relatively high. And from April to May, there is a deficit in bank foreign exchange settlement and sales, and we could see a net outflow of hot money. And in September, the on onshore RMB fell below the seventh threshold, uh, first time since Ju July 2020. So we could see the factors affecting the volatility of RMB are becoming more complex. But generally speaking, the pressure is still manageable because China has sufficient foreign exchange instrument to sta stabilize the rate. And compared to other basket currencies, the depreciation of RMB is relatively small. And in other words, we could see uh, appreciation against most other currencies of of the RMB. So in the second half of the year, as China's macroeconomy stabilized, export will still be resilient in the short term and the rising risk of economic stagnation in Europe and the States also support the RMB. And next we can move to the second part uh, is about external and internal risks and challenges facing the economy. And we know the chi Chinese economy is facing increasing external uncertainties and risks. First and most evident external factor is a reshaped geoeconomic lands landscape. And we could see the Russia-Ukraine war has opened a new chapter in international relations with important implications to the global economic order. And now the world is facing higher inflation pressure, tightening monetary and financial conditions, and geopolitical and social tensions. And the direct impact of the military conflict on the Chinese economy, I should say, is relatively limited. But the war and the associated sanctions will affect the Chinese economy in various channels, including the energy supply, financial risk, geopolitical risk, and supply chain disruptions. And as for financial risk, we could see the decoupling risk is on the rise. On the other hand, the strong inflation prints suggest the Fed will further pressure to continue the large rate hikes as interest rate is likely to stay higher for longer. This will limit the macro policy space for China to a certain extent. And right now the fiscal policy space is restrained as well. And for China, I would say the most prominent downside risks remain those related to the pandemic. COVID-19 has a serious impact on China's economy and disrupted the existing policies and weighing on private 
investment on consumption. Since 2020, with the emergence of the COVID-19, the focus of China's macro policy has shifted to pre- um, pandemic prevention and hedging against the negative impact of the pandemic. And now we could see the street index of the pandemic prevention remain at a very high level. So it's not over yet. Uh, but what we could say is that the impact of the pandemic is marginally diminishing and is evolving in a more predictable way. And the next, so the market expectations are low. Like over this, we can see the VIX index continue to run at a very high level due to the fat interest rate hikes, which can indicate the current market sentiment. And from the domestic perspective, we can see the confidence index of the residents uh, and uh, which reflect the long-term expectations is significantly lower. And also business confidence is running slow. And also for the market, vitality is still insufficient. We can see the operation of small and medium-sized enterprise face multiple difficulties and the loss of industrial enterprises are still large. And also here is a serious problem of unemployment for the young. It's reached a high level of uh, 18.7 in August. So this is a very serious problem and has negative implications for the longer term. We have a saying that confidence is even more important than gold and it's necessary to reverse the current downturn from the demand side to add momentum to GDP growth, especially to restore confidence for customers and entrepreneurs. And currently the real course of low investment in China, I think is the lack of confidence in entrepreneurs and the policies to encourage entrepreneurship and innovation introduced in recent years has played a role, but the recent, like the policy adjustment coupled with the COVID-19 has disrupted the confidence of the entrepreneurs and restrict their willingness to invest. So the authorities should be cautious on the policy adjustment. Another prominent issue of China is the debt risk and potential regional financial risk. From our estimation, the leverage ratio of the non-financial sector is close to 290. And if the average financing cost is 3% or 5% respectively, the annual interest payment would reach 9% and 14% of GDP. So this number is pretty high. Also need to pay attention to the property sector vulnerabilities and the financial stability. Here I want to share our views on the property sector. We have seen slowing real estate investment following policy efforts to reduce leverage. And on the surface, the current problem is like capital and liquidity stress. But in reality, I think it's more of a cyclical issue. It's determined by the law of supply and demand. And from the supply side, we can see the cumulative supply of the property sector in China is still at a high level. And from the demand side, with the slowdown of population growth, lower residents' income and expectations. Customer demand for housing has further weakened. So the current capital chain problem is the result rather than the course of the problem. And now we could see some supportive measures and policies for the real estate sector. But I think it's more to eliminate the associated risk and enhance the financial stability. But the downward trend of the real estate in China is hard to reverse. In the end, I would like to share economic outlook and policy response. As I mentioned in our baseline scenario, China's GDP growth will ease to 4% in 2022 with continued recovery in the second half of the year. We have done some calculations here. If the growth rate need to reach reach 5% for the whole year, it has to reach 7.2% for the second half of the year. And in our forecast, the GDP for Q4 will reach 6% in our baseline scenario and 6.9% with enhanced policy. And China continues to face the policy challenge to balance the long-term goal and growth target. 
well compared to a short-term growth target, I think we should not lose sight of critical structural reforms. And in the next few years, China will still be in the stage of transition. We need to think more about the efficiency of capital use, the release of that risk and transformation of economic drivers. And in order to achieve a more balanced and inclusive and sustainable growth path, China still has a lot of opportunities. We can see that China has huge market space, domestic market, and also key element for technology advancement, carbon transition and digitalization. They are all providing new forces to drive the economy. It's also important for China to strengthen the regional ties with through the CPTPP and also RCEP with Asian Pacific partners. So just as my topic for the presentation is the recovery of China's economy is like steering through turbulent waters. But we know China is a giant ship and is a very resilient economy. So we're still confident that the Chinese economy will continue its steady growth after all those turbulence. Thank you, Ms. Lina Wang and Mr. Asushi Matsuda-san. Thank you very much for your good presentation. And we are now going to turn to the questions. The first one is that the oil price hikes seem to be factoring in supply disruptions from the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Has the OPEC plus the decision to cut back on supply on supply being factored in? I think that uh, it has a symbolic meaning. Uh, right now, uh, that OPEC share in the world production, so oil production is just 40%. Uh, that is the decline from a fifty percent, and this time and the production is agreed upon to cut by two percent. So two percent reduction by forty percent share means more than a percent in compared to the world uh, production capacity. So in that sense, um, <clears throat> that the uh, magnitude of the uh, cut down is not so big to impact of the world uh, demand and the supply sides. But I think and the, under uh, these tough situations and the agreements for OPEC countries still remain valid, I think and it's a, a can carry up on kind of market signal to the market. So uh, I think uh, that is the meaning and also that the factor of the, uh, this and the OPEC agreements. For the China property crisis, please share your view on the development and the impact. Uh, as to the real estate bubble in China, uh, I think uh, the central government made a, a right decision, but uh, the government chose uh, by the time to make to make the uh, market clear of the real estate, real estate market. As my colleague Lina introduced, that the uh, micro leverage uh, rate of China is very high because the debt scale is as much as three times of the GDP, uh, which means all the GDP growth has been uh, eaten by the debt. So the uh, so the debt problem has made China's economy growth is uh, useless because. Uh, people's conditions cannot be uh, improved uh, by the uh, GDP growth. Uh, all, all, uh, most of their earnings are paid to the banks uh, or the uh, financial uh, de uh, department of the economy. So it's right for the central government to, you know, to control the uh, real property bubble because in, in China, the economy is already by uh, local governments, but the local governments uh, use the uh, land as a collector to, you know, to, to absorb the resources from the banks. Uh, uh, so the debt problem is very serious. But the time is uh, a very bad time because in 2020, uh, the pandemic back China's economy very seriously, uh, especially China's government made a very uh, strict 
prevention and control policies, uh, people cannot get uh, money from from the market, especially uh, the unemployment rate in China is very high, especially for the young people, uh, nearly 20%. They don't have money and they don't want to uh, buy the uh, houses or buy the real estate. So the time is the timing is very bad. And now the local governments, their physical problems are very serious because they cannot uh, get a physical incomes from the uh, land, uh, land renting or, 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 land, or land selling. Another problem is that the balance sheet, the balance sheet of residents are shrinking very seriously because 70% of the wealth of the residents is on the property. So, so I think the uh, uh, central government uh, will, you know, will uh, uh, ease the policy uh, to stop uh, China's economy uh, in China. Yeah, to avoid from the hard landing. Uh, Mr. Matsuda-san, you uh, explained that the great moderation did not end by the global financial crisis in 2008. Do you think that Great moderation has really ended in 2020-22. If so, why? Yeah, that's a little bit hard to make a judgment that uh, if uh, the great moderation caused by the uh, structural change, like uh, IT or maybe uh, service sectors, and, uh, and the maybe a structural factor uh, remains, so in that sense, if uh, the uh, Russian crisis uh, may occur, uh, maybe some stability will be resumed. But one question is inflation. Um, great moderation too, which is stemming from uh, 2009 to the 2019. Uh, this great moderation too is a low inflation level is very important. If inflation is high, I think and the macroeconomic stability is not secured. That, that if under the high inflation environment, we can expect more volatility. So in that sense, um, uh, to uh, maybe great moderation three is possible or not, that depends on to what extent inflation can be uh, contained, uh, controlled. Uh, that's uh, maybe very important determinants whether that these structural elements of the lower volatility in the macroeconomy. That's my uh, thinking. Thank you. Thank you. I also got some more questions for you. As the recession has already started to US and going to start in other parts of the world soon, do you have any idea for how long this recession will stay for? Yeah, I think that the severity of the recession will be determined the two or three factors. One is the most important factor is maybe this Ukraine war crisis. To what extent the Ukraine crisis may continue and to what extent further sanction to the Russia is a strength. That's important factor number one. And <clears throat> Number one, uh, number two factor is maybe the inflations or maybe policy response. And I think the recent two episodes of the great financial crisis, Lehman shock and also the, this and the COVID shock. And the uh, policy response is uh, changing from the past. And the uh, government authority, it's not a hesitation, has no hesitation to making a massive injection of the liquidity and a massive fiscal policy. This is a notable change from the past. But to what extent another uh, unprecedented monetary easing is possible, unprecedented fiscal injection is possible, that is a little bit questions. Monetary policy is uh, the degree of freedom is constrained because of the inflation is tight. And the fiscal policy degree of freedom uh, may be constrained because government debt level is already high. So in that sense, to what extent and the government to intervene. This is the second important determinant to what extent 
and the recession is serious or not. But if everything and the authority determine, I think authority has a power uh, to contain of uh, this recession. That is uh, maybe a uh, lesson learned we from uh, this great financial crisis of 2008 and the COVID shock of 2019. So if government move, I think and, uh, uh, this recession is uh, going to be controlled. That is my observation. Thank you, Mr. San. There are two questions related to India. I will share that with you too. I saw that the probability projection for recession in India is close to zero, given the vari variation of growth rates around AP. Can you shed some more light on it? Another one is how much India economy will affect due to the global recession. As the recent Bloomberg survey in your presentation say, India will not be in recession. <laughs> yes, <Thank you>. um, <laughs> yeah, uh, the, this uh, survey is uh, showing to the zero percent recession to the India. That's uh, that's a result of the survey uh, conducted by Bloomberg. So it's not a kind of a uh, detailed result of the economic analysis. So we have to look into the uh, individual or uh, case study for India. I don't think and uh, India is now still uh, open to the world economy. And also that uh, for uh, two factors and the uh, food price increase is affecting a lot to the India. But recently that the uh, India agriculture sector is very strong. That is the first thing. And the second thing, and the in, in India is went through uh, some tough uh, process to the overcome of uh, difficulty uh, for recent years. And then they change uh, kind of a non-performing loan issue of the public bank of India. Uh, so in that sense, uh, that they are overcoming to the kind of uh, the structural fragility. Uh, but India still engaging into the trade with the neighboring country. And to what extent in India, also that the China is a sustain of those trade relations in the worldwide, that is the source of the kind of a last hope to sustain and global avoid avoid of the uh, worldwide recession is actually occur or not. And that is my observations. So it's very important to uh, uh, India, uh, the authority, how that the Indian authority uh, react to the uh, change in the world environment. What is the reason for such high leverage ratio as non-financial firms are taking 290% more debt than they have asset to back in up? Is it Latin financial policy by lending institutions? So, so Grace, can I uh, answer the question in Chinese and uh, ask Lina to help me to translate it into in yes, it? please. Yes. The reason for such a high leverage ratio to reach 290% is because China has many large SOEs and LGFB financing vehicles. So that's the reason why we have such a high leverage ratio. Okay, so the local governments, they have much land in hand. They use the land as collateral. So they have asset in their hand. And the financial institutions are state-owned as well. So they are willing to like let them have the loans. So in such a high number, is there is a high proportion from large SOEs and financing vehicles. They are not all private companies. There's a, one more question for uh, Matsuda san Given that Sri Lanka is currently undergoing INF negotiation, is it fair to assume that the recession probability for Sri Lanka is at 85%? Yeah, this is the last percentage which I show is a survey result conducted by Bloomberg. So Bloomberg is conducted to the survey research and to in Sri Lanka. 80% of people is saying to the uh, recessions, but the 15% still believe and the uh, Sri Lanka economy is revived. And that is the meaning of 85%. But 
if and the、uh, two consecutive uh, uh, shrink of the GDP is defined as a, the recessions, I think and then it's already a recession in the Sri Lanka economy. So、oh, please do not、uh, to consider 80% is probability, it's a, a survey result. We got a lot of questions. Okay, one more question for Lena. China's pandemic control, zero COVID policy, have、uh, affected China's growth, have negative、uh, cross border impacts, global trade and investment flow. Could you have a、uh, uh, please comment on if China relaxed the COVID policy, zero COVID policy, and what, what are the con conditions for that? For the pandemic control policy,、uh, you know, government is government.、Uh, government always w a n t to do something.、Uh, China is a bit unique、uh, because uh, in uh, foreign countries, especially in Western countries,、uh, the people themselves they, they don't like this kind of policy. policy.、Uh, especially in the US, people even think that、uh, wearing a mask. Uh, getting the way to talk to God.、Uh, but in China, the situation is very、uh, different. Ordinary people,、uh, they don't、uh, prepare to, you know, to, to face the fact to infect the virus.、Uh, especially now, uh, uh, many local governments are still be punished、uh, because of,、uh, they cannot prevent the virus spreading. There are all kinds of uh, uh, disadvantages in China's、uh, medical system and medical care system. So it's very hard for,、uh, for China to, you know, to、uh, abandon the pandemic uh, policy. Uh, even, uh, even the economy confronting a very uh, difficult uh, situation, China's economy is facing a very、uh, great pressure because of the Uh, pandemic control policy, especially accommodation and uh, catering, uh, wholesale and uh, retail, uh, transportation, culture, uh, industrial uh, industries, and uh, tourism. All these、uh, industries are experiencing a very negative goods. But,、uh, you know, the central government has、uh, made their minds that the、uh, control policy. Uh, will continue. So that is a fact. Uh, uh, personally speaking,、uh, for myself, I hope the government can, you know, can abandon the pandemic、uh, policy totally.、Uh, but uh, it, uh, it is not comply with the uh, government's uh, decision.、Uh, one more question for, for Majida san. The land price already showing a decline in prices as in graphs. So, does that mean it will be easier to default for this fund than to pay back their borrowings? Reference the 2008 mortgage recession. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, it's very important in terms of the credit cycle and also a business cycle. I think land price is a key role to bridging from a credit cycle to the, to the Uh, business cycle. Affordability or maybe absorbability of the land price decline is very depends on the economy. Like the United States,、uh, the land price is、uh, increase. Well, they explain maybe 30%, 40% decline, and the cyclicality is observed. So, in that sense, And they are prepared for some downside、uh, when、uh, the, the, this sort of thing is occurred. In Japan, before、uh, 85, we never saw、uh, the, the land price fall, just rising and rising. After 95, land price never rises. Wow,、well, recently a little bit increased, but the, almost 20 years and the continuous decline. So, to what extent and,、uh, can we、uh, see of、uh, those s o r t of p r i c e is anticipated?、Uh, this is、uh, based upon a、uh, kind of uh, uh, anticipation of the、uh, default rates. So, in that sense, and the、uh, default rates may、uh, increase or may not increase, depends on the country situation. So, generally speaking,、uh, it's very difficult、uh, to predict. 
But the, when uh, the uh, many uh, finances depend upon kind, kind of a uh, loan to value ratio, and the, if uh, the land price decline, loan to value ratio increase, and as a result, maybe liquidity uh, stop and the new lending is stop. So some vicious cycles occurred. So uh, response is maybe um, putting uh, some additional liquidity, but the, is that an uh, effective measure to turn around of the land price falling? Uh, this sort of um, response is very important. So in that sense, and the, I explained to that this and the macro prudential regulation is very important. TV uh, regulations and also collateral regulations and also the Japanese experience, financial inspections by authorities were also very important. That is affecting to the lending stance of the uh, individual bank. If the financial inspection is uh, making a kind of a very tough pace, that's cause the deterioration of the, uh, this and the credit buyer cycle between credit cycle and the business cycle. So in that sense, generally speaking, still, I think, and the, Big fall in the land price is may cause to the some jump in the default rates. Actually, we have a run of time, but the question has still come in. <laughs> so I have obtained uh, Abba's uh, agreement to extend the session for some more minutes. Post the question to Lena. There are two questions for you. Could you please uh, highlight highlight as a song? Highlight us on how China is uh, planning to create avenues for investors, producers, and uh, reduce an, an employment rate in presence of tighter monetary regulation. The second one is if the loan default rate in China is expected to rise, then what are the strategies to mitigate the credit risk? For the first question, to create uh, for investor, producer, and uh, reduce unemployment rate, because uh, China will still put forward like accommodative uh, policies to support like fiscal and also monetary. Because right now, I think the, the very important thing is to restore the confidence of the consumption and investment. And uh, also for the loan default risk in China, and if we talk about, uh, we, we still need to focus on the uh, risk related to the property sector. And uh, in the short term, we have to like put forward some, uh, the, like to release the regulations on the property sector to a certain extent to avoid the, as Lynn just mentioned, the hard lending of the real estate sector. And uh, also, I think China still have space although the space is quite limited but china has space to like uh, uh, in the monetary for monetary policy accommodations so uh, i would say the strategies to mitigate the credit risk would be to like uh, uh, like lower the interest rate and have accommodative policies thank you uh san what is the effect of the rise in interest rates by the U.S. Fed in East Asia and Southeast Asia? I think the three avenues is very important. First one is the direct impact of the dollar appreciations. Dollar appreciates against almost all the uh, currency in the world. As a result, maybe a uh, trade relation may be affected. And, it, and then this is a, a fast impact. And the second impact is maybe uh, uh, capital flow. I explained that and, uh, as a result of the U.S. Cap uh, interest hike and the capital uh, outflow is observed from emerging markets. Um, this one is uh, causing to the, some of the uh, impact to the uh, domestic economy. And the third one, uh, in response to uh, those uh, the uh, data exchange rate uh, appreciations, and also capital outflow. Maybe emerging market and the central bank is uh, highly likely to uh, render to the interest rate hike as well. So as a result, and maybe uh, the uh, 
Central Bank of Southeast Asia have to uh, rise, and that's happened to actually several countries. So all those interest rate in, uh, the response is a maybe third venue of the uh, impact. So uh, in summary, uh, appreciation exchange rate, interest rate, the capital of growth, those three are maybe impact of the US policy action. The last question for China. Uh, China's GDP highly dependent on exports, and in a time of recession, the demand for these uh, Chinese goods and the service will definitely decrease. In such a situation, how Chinese enterprise can have confidence and can achieve 4% of GDP growth? I doubt. Could you please uh, put some light on this? I think as for export, it will stay resilient in the short term. And uh, I think in the second half of the year, it's mainly supported by the policy factors, including the, mm, like the infrastructure and also the supporting policies. But if we have a, like the resurgence of the pandemic in some cities uh, or some external factors affecting the economy, like the GDP might be lower than 4%, I think. And if Lin has something else to add. The importance of the export sector has no longer been an important engine for the economic growth in China right now. And what is added to GDP is the net, in, net export rather than export itself. So although the export is on the decline, the, as uh, weakened with weakened demand domestic. So we have lower import as well. So the next export on the GDP is not that huge. So the infrastructure mm -hmm. investment in China will remain strong and it has a growth rate of more, more than 10%. And only relying on this infrastructure investment, China can achieve a good GDP growth, but re relying on the infrastructure investment itself cannot achieve a good quality of growth. Like, like people, the residents cannot share the growth of GDP, the outcome. Okay, last question for Matsuda-san. In Japan, monetary policy stance has not changed despite of revived inflation and the rapid depreciation of yen exchange rate. Why has the monetary policy not changed and when will it change? I think it's a very <laughs> uh, difficult questions. And maybe uh, the, I answer to the uh, two dimensions, different dimensions. First one is, as I explained, that the first nine years of the Mr. Kuroda's uh, time, and uh, this 2% inflation target cannot be met. And they long for, meeting of this 2% inflation targets, but uh, they couldn't meet of this target. This and the waiting period is too long. So um, when uh, everybody asking to the interest hike, uh, governor may say, not yet. So uh, that is maybe a way of thinking and uh, to uh, maybe a conservative way to do uh, making an inflation response. <laughs> and second one is uh, if and, uh, we uh, started to increase uh, interest policy uh, interest rates, that's a very difficult task. And also that uh, uh, maintenance of the monetary policy is continue uh, for certain times. As you know, uh, Mr. Kuroda's term is ended next April, and the uh, next April 8. So maybe governor consider uh, this task so to managing to the inflations is a very uh, important task and also long lasting task. And they would like to deter to the, uh, his successor for tackling this task. So oh, I think and, uh, um, there is uh, some possibility to the uh, early change of the uh, uh, central gov governor, but uh, today that the prime minister saying, maybe uh, we, we don't think about the kind of early change of the uh, central bank governor. So in that sense, 
maybe this timing issue may relate to the, this uh, inactive uh, monetary policy so far uh, Bank of Japan is taking. Uh, the, those two uh, possible explanations is maybe to deter, but the, I'm suffering to, we are suffering to the 146 yen per dollar. Uh, so I think and, uh, uh, it's very good time for everybody to come to Japan uh, because in the, uh, Japan quarantine control is relaxed and they still uh, foreign visitor is limited. So it's best time to come by uh, before that monetary, monetary policy uh, will be changed. Thank you. Thank you all again and goodbye. Great, thank you. Thank you, Zan-san, Lee-san-san. Thank you. Zan -san, Lee -san -san. Thank you.